So maybe I'm not Methodist, but I recognize there's more to them than just being hippies. Hey guys, welcome back to Kingdom Craft, where I build this big church in Minecraft while I talk about Christianity. And today I'm doing another one of those videos where I talk about why I'm not various things. And yeah, today I'm talking about why I'm not Methodist. Despite the fact that I have a lot of respect for Methodists in different ways. I mean, after all, the college that I go to was originally affiliated with the Methodist Church. But still, I couldn't really see myself being Methodist. Like some of these videos where I said why I'm not Anglican or Lutheran, I could still see myself eventually going to an Anglican or Lutheran church if there's no Presbyterian church in the area, but Methodist is like a, a tier below that. So there is a, a really just one big reason why I'm not Methodist, but there are a lot of similarities between Methodist and Presbyterian, because you could put like all the different traditions on a scale from high church to low church. High Church is like Catholics and Orthodox that take the church itself very seriously, and the sacraments are like a huge part of what they do. And Low Church is like Baptist and non-denominational, where the church itself isn't that important, it's mostly about your personal faith. And the sacraments have basically no importance at all, um, if they even call them sacraments. And, you know, High Church is more likely to have a church that looks like this, Low Church is most likely to not care about the church building at all, have it look very simple, or just rent out some, I don't know, school or gym. Yeah, so, Presbyterians and Methodists are, they both are on the same, like, place in that spectrum. They both have a sort of balance between High Church and Low Church. They're both, like, equally likely to have, um traditional worship or contemporary worship, for example, and they have, uh, we have quite similar views on the sacraments, too. Um, both of us have a sort of spiritual presence view of the Lord's Supper. Both of us believe baptism saves in some sense, but not the same way that Lutherans or Catholics think it does. So, the big difference between us is one long, one obnoxiously long word called soteriology. And what you'll notice if you ever study theology is that theologians express simple things in complicated terms. They do the opposite of what good teachers should do. Good teachers are supposed to express complicated concepts in simple terms, and theologians do the opposite. So all that soteriology means is what is your view of how salvation works. That's all it means. Um, and on that question, Presbyterians and Methodists are opposites. Because Presbyterians are Calvinist and Methodists are Arminian. And most people who call themselves Calvinist and Arminian don't know what either of those mean in a historical sense. Calvinism, for example, doesn't just mean you believe in the five points, like you believe in TULIP. In case you don't know what that is, um, there are five points that sum up the Calvinist view of how salvation works, which is that there's total depravity, that we're totally um, too sinful to accept the gospel. There's unconditional election, which is that God chooses us not based on any choice or action we do. There's limited atonement, which is that Jesus' sacrifice will only cover the sins of the people God chose. There's irresistible grace, which is that when God decides to save someone, they will be saved no matter what. And perseverance of the saints, which is that the elect will persevere to the end and will not fall away from the faith. And Arminianism arose in response to that, but just like people misunderstand Calvinism and think it's just about those five points, people misunderstand Arminianism and think that um, Arminianism is like the complete opposite of Calvinism, but it's not. Arminianism actually arose out, out of the Calvinist tradition. Arminius himself was a Calvinist. And a lot of people who aren't Calvinists will say they're Arminian, or, or more likely what happens, usually what happens is um, Calvinists, or people who think they're Calvinists, will call anyone who is not one of them an Arminian. But um, neither of those are accurate. So the only, like, a lot of Baptists and non-denominationals who agree with those five points will call themselves Calvinist, but... Calvinism is a whole set of beliefs, not just beliefs about soteriology, because, um, for example, infant baptism is part of Calvinism, and by definition, no Baptist agrees with infant baptism. So, um, uh, and a, lo a lot of, the only denominations that are truly Calvinist are denominations that are Presbyterian or Dutch Reformed. And 
So likewise, the only denominations that are truly Arminian are the Methodists, because most people who call themselves Arminian are not really part of that Arminian tradition that arose out of the, the Calvinist tradition. But Methodists are examples of um, people who actually are legitimately Arminian. John Wesley was an Arminian, and that's why his school of thought is called Wesleyan Arminianism. So Methodist and Wesleyan as theological terms can sort of be used interchangeably, because they are basically the same thing, theologically speaking. Um, so yeah, Methodists are the legit OG Arminians. Um, Arminian with an I, not Armenia. Armenia is not only a country, Armenia is a, Armenian Christianity is a form of Christianity, it's a form of Oriental Orthodoxy, and supposedly I've heard like they're the weirdest of the bunch. But um, I, I, my roommate in college is Armenian, and he uh, at least has some sort of background in that church. So um, I've not investigated um, the Armenian Apostolic Church, but it's an interesting bit of trivia that Armenia was the first um, country to officially adopt Christianity as the state religion. But I'm getting way off track. My point was that um, yeah, Methodists are Armenian, which in terms of soteriology is the opposite of Calvinism, even if it's pretty close to Calvinism on other issues that do not have to do with soteriology. Okay, I'll stop saying that. I, I'm, I'm just making fun of how obnoxiously long a bunch of theology words are. Here's another thing. There's a, in terms of Calvinism, there's a word called infralapsarian or supralapsarian, and all it means is, are you a nice Calvinist or a mean Calvinist? I, I know it's more than that. The infralapsarian versus superlapsarian debate is basically, did God make people just to damn them? Because that's really the concern everyone has when they learn what Calvinism is. The infralapsarian position, my position and the majority position, and John Calvin's position, was that no, um, election is in view of the facts, is in view of the fall. And the supralapsarian position is that God actively caused the fall to happen in order to justify damning the non-elect. And that's what, um, like, Calvin's successor, Theodore Beza, held to. Um, but yeah, I'm, get I'm getting way off track. My point is just that a lot of theology words are way longer than they need to, and than, than they need to be. So, Calvinism, basically, um, there's the five points. The essence of the Calvinist view on soteriology is that salvation is not a free will choice. It's, it's not saying we have no free will. Um, of course, everything falls under God controlling every single event. But in some sense, that can be compatible with our choices, since we don't know what the we don't know what the future is. However, um, salvation, from a Calvinist perspective, is not a free will choice in any sense at all. God decides who will come to faith and who will not, and because of that, we cannot take credit for our salvation. That's the beauty of Calvinism. Um, like, if you're a believer, why are you a believer and someone else isn't? Is it because you're smarter than them? Is it because you're more moral than them? Is it because you just... you? It's like you made the right choice, but why did you make the right choice and someone else didn't? That question is inescapable. And if you believe it's because of your free will, then you... The logical conclusion of that is there's something in you that caused you to make the right choice and someone else to make the wrong choice. That, that same bee has always been around here, just spinning around and uh, always hanging out around me. I should give it a name sometime. Um, it, it's probably a she, because I think it's the female bees that are usually out and about. I know things don't have genders in Minecraft, but because I'm a, a conservative person, I don't let anything be gender neutral. Anyway, <laughs> uh, I'm, I get way off track sometimes, I apologize. So, uh, what was I going to do? Yeah, I'm gonna, I was going to go shear some trees. So yeah, um, it, the Calvinist position is that salvation is not based on a free will choice at all. And the Arminian position is that it is. John Wesley, who I have a lot of respect for, he's sort of like the theological father of the Methodist tradition, which arose out of the Anglican tradition. Um, that's kind of why I made this video right after I made the episode about why I'm not Anglican. Um, John f free will was extremely important to John Wesley's theology. and. He affirmed, as the Reformers did, that salvation is by faith alone, that we can't earn our salvation. Salvation is completely a work of, of grace through faith, and Methodists would affirm that, of course. But he still gave a much greater role to the human role in salvation than, like, Luther and especially Calvin would, because John Wesley said that, um, it's like, we're responsible 
for pursuing holiness. He said, are, we are still justified by faith alone, but it is the responsibility of a Christian to make sure they're always trying to improve themselves, and if they don't, if they get lazy and get spiritually dead, they could fall away from the faith and lose their salvation. So yes, um, Arminians, along with Lutherans, believe that you can indeed lose your salvation, but the difference is that Lutherans um, generally do not think that losing your salvation has anything to do with not striving for holiness. Lutherans are very careful to insist that works and even intentions have nothing to do with salvation, that salvation is based on the objective justification that Jesus purchased for us on the cross. But Methodists are much more likely to be um, synergistic, meaning to say that salvation is in some sense us cooperating with God's grace, even though they still say we're justified by faith alone, to basically stay in a position of faith, we need to actively pursue righteousness. And the goal, according to John Wesley, is to achieve entire sanctification. What does that mean? Entire sanctification is a point that a Christian can reach in their life where they no longer sin. This is the weirdest thing with Methodist theology, in my opinion, is entire sanctification. Luther and Calvin would never say that it's possible for a Christian in this life to ever get to a point where they can literally stop sinning. But John Wesley, uh, at least this is what the Methodist tradition teaches, I'm not sure if Wesley himself taught it, I assume he did, correct me if I'm wrong, is that a Christian in this life can actually stop sinning. And that's, I think that's kind of ridiculous. But um, that's kind of why I'm not Methodist. But there are many reasons why I am, and um, one of them is that they see the Christian life as a battle. They use a lot of military metaphors for the Christian life, which I think is great. A lot of army and kingdom metaphors, and I have adopted that myself. I use a lot of those. The whole name of this series is called Kingdom Craft, right? And um, the, the great hymn, Rejoice the Lord is King, was written by Charles Wesley, who was John Wesley's brother, who wrote a lot of great hymns. Um, so that's one of the really good things coming out of the Methodist tradition, because they're always talking about progress in, like, growing in holiness and stuff. They really do talk about the Christian life as a battle, which it absolutely is. So that's something Methodists are 100% spot on about. And that's something I really respect about the Methodist tradition. And on that subject of the Christian life being a battle, I'm going to go defend my church from all these mobs that are outside instead of just running away and sleeping. I'm going to call this axe the... I'll call it the Zoomer Battle Axe. How about that? And I'm going to also make myself a set of armor. Maybe, um... Okay, I officially designate this little nook as the church armory, uh, which defends it from hostile mobs. Um... Okay, maybe I'll even make a sign. How about this? Um, I'll make a sign that says, uh... uh it'll, it'll be posted up here. It'll be like, um... Church Armory. And I'll say over here, Inspired by the Based Methodists. So this is my... Maybe I'll do, um, one room in every, um... Every, uh, part of my church will be dedicated to respecting another theological tradition. The church itself is Presbyterian, but actually the, it's too dark to read, I'll, I'll make it like this. Um, I'll dedicate one room to respecting another tradition, and this will be for the Methodists. So this is the church armory, and I'll say inspired by the based Methodists. And I have a third sign here, I'll say um, Rejoice the Lord is King, which is that um, Wesley and him. Okay, now I think um, I'll make my armor and then I'm ready for battle. I'll put on the full armor of God, like that verse is, I know. I'm, I know it's just an analogy, I'm not literally doing anything here. Okay, um, I got armor, now it's time to fight some mobs. Uh, okay, here's a creeper. I don't want the creeper to blow up what I've built. So, yes, two hits. The Zoomer Battle Axe is working very well. Um, fight this Skelly Boy. Okay, uh, I'm going to pretend that these mobs are everything trying to destroy the church. So, because the Methodist Church is, um, and not just the Methodist Church, all the mainline churches are being invaded with 
heresy, so these mobs are all heresies. That that zombie I just killed was um, Nestorianism, let's just say. I don't want to say it's people, because the Bible says we do not wage against flesh and blood. We wa wage against, like, dark spiritual powers. So, the mobs are heresies, not heretics. Okay, this one was um, semi-Pelagianism, which is ironic because the Methodist view almost approaches semi-Pelagianism, which says that we can come to faith on our own without God calling us, but they get out, they get out of it because Arminians do believe in what's called prevenient grace, which is that God frees our wills so that we can come to him. It's still not ideal, especially from a Calvinist perspective, but it's better than... Um, it's not. It's still not semi-Pelagian because they do save themselves from completely falling into semi-Pelagianism, and semi-Pelagianism still isn't a complete heresy, but it's it's a, a pretty bad heterodoxy, I would say. All right, so I'm planting some of this. You know what? I need to go to the Nether because I was trying to say how trying to think how I could light this place up, but um, I need to go to the Nether to get some. I need to go to the Nether to get some glowstone. Because I want to put, like, glowstone underneath the water so that the water itself can be lit up. Maybe that's what I'll do in the in the next episode. Um, maybe if I go to the nether um, in that episode, I'll do something like talking about hell. Have I already gone to the nether? I, I'm forgetting. I, I feel like I I have gone to the nether, but I um, I forget. I, I try to make the... Um, themes of the videos somewhat correlate to what I'm doing in Minecraft, like, you know, I'm, I'm battling a bunch of people, and that, um, that zombie was the spirit of uh, not thinking baptism saves. <laughs> I'm joking, that's not a heresy, that's just a heterodoxy. Uh, anyway. So, uh, yeah, I went over why I'm not Methodist, and then why I still respect Methodists. Um, I guess now I'll talk about uh, the the dangers that Methodism could and somewhat has caused. I was in this Bible study with these British guys yesterday. They told me something I didn't know, but it makes sense. Like, a lot of the whole word of faith stuff they said sprang from Arminianism, and at first I didn't see the connection, but when they explained it, I kind of do, because that arose from, like, charismatic stuff, which I already knew. The whole word of faith that you can, like, speak things into existence. And it's completely disconnected from Christianity, but, um, it's, it's just, it appeals to, um, like, it just gets a popular following, and it appeals to people's lack of knowledge. So, that's obviously heretical. And it comes from the whole, from, like, charismatic stuff. And you could trace charismatic stuff back to Methodism, because charismatic stuff came from um, Pentecostalism, and Pentecostalism came from Methodism. So it's like a several um, generations removed, but there still is some root. I guess the I guess if I could draw a connection, it's that Arminian theology is a bit too man centered. It's more man centered than the other branches of. Um, Protestant theology, because Lutheranism and Calvinism are, especially Calvinism, more so than Lutheranism, are very God-centered because they place, they really emphasize God's role in salvation over and against the role of, of man. Now, Lutherans, they still are monergists, meaning they believe salvation is 100% a work of God and 0% a work of man, but even so, they're a bit, um, their theology is more about they see theology as about how to give us assurance rather than how to just glorify God. Um, I, I see a lot of Lutherans arguing like, oh, we shouldn't think this way because it doesn't give us assurance of salvation. And it's like, okay, but that's not necessarily the biggest priority for Reformed people. So, but still, Lutheranism and Calvinism are still essentially the same when it comes to being monergist, whereas Arminians are more synergist, meaning they think salvation is in some sense a cooperation between God and man. Um, so that's, I guess you could say that um, they're man-centered, not man-centered, slightly more man-centered than Calvinist view of salvation. 
can lead to some really sussy movements like Word of Faith and Pentecostalism. But yeah, overall, um, there's nothing like seriously bad about Methodism. And I know like some people are going to be like, okay, what about all the progressive, the progressive Methodists? And it's like, I'm, I'm sure you're like, why haven't you talked about that in this video yet? Here's the thing. Every Protestant branch has a progressive and a conservative wing to it. So everyone's like, oh, some Methodists are progressive. I heard about this Methodist pastor who's like a, a lesbian atheist. And I'm like, well, you'll find that in every Protestant branch. In Presbyterians, Lutherans, Baptists, they all have a liberal wing because the mainline Protestant churches were all hijacked by secularists. So every Protestant denomination is a battleground. And a lot, there's been a lot of splits very, very recently, like this year. The Global Methodist Church split off from the United Methodist Church because the United Methodist Church was getting too liberal. And I think that was a terrible decision because a lot of times when those splits happened, it was because the, um, the conservatives were just hopelessly outnumbered by the liberals. But in this case, the conservatives had the majority and still fled because they just didn't want to fight. And I think that was an act of pure cowardice. I'm sorry. <coughs> it's like I can sort of see it in like the Episcopal Church where the conservative Anglicans were just so outnumbered I could in some sense see it in the PCA splitting from like the um, what did become the PCUSA but in the case of the Methodists there is no excuse that was they should not have done that the, the global Methodist Church was a mistake to create and I said what I said because um, a lot of these Protestant institutions have been hijacked by, um, by people who don't believe the Christian faith. That's why you will see examples in every Protestant branch of, like, you know, lesbian atheist priests. But it only got that bad because the conservatives in these situations were always cowards and fled. So... I'm not when I when I criticize Methodists, I'm not going to bring up the liberalism that exists in the Methodist Church, because there's no more liberalism within Methodism than there is in like Presbyterianism or Lutheranism or Anglicanism. All the mainstream Protestant denominations are struggling with liberalism, so I I have no place to judge there because my denomination, the PCUSA, has just as much liberalism as the United Methodist Church. Um, and there's conservative offshoots like the PCA and the OPC, and even like moderately conservative ones like ECO, but I want to stay and fight because I don't want to let them continue to use um, places that were meant to worship God and use it for blasphemy. Alright, that's about it for this episode. I'm going to continue speeding it up while I work on this. I feel like the majority of the work I do is in speed-ups, but, you know, it's just, a, it's just a time thing. And I can focus a bit more on what I'm working on if I'm not talking. But yeah, so I'm going to try to finish this hedge thing, and yeah, then I'll see you guys next time. Bye.